The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. John chapter 6, we'll be reading verses 56 through 69 there. John chapter 6, beginning with verse 56, reading on through verse 69. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe, and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you have come and that you are the Holy One of God. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. We may do what you call us to do. So, Lord, we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, up until that point in my life, it was one of the most difficult things I had ever tried, at least physically ever tried, but I wasn't really sure why it was so hard. I mean, I'd watched several people do it before me, probably a dozen or so, and it was like they didn't even have to think about it. And a lot of them, if I'm just being honest with with y'all while we're in this room, I was a lot smarter than most of them. It was a simple enough thing, but every time, every time I attempted to do it, I looked like a fool. Like I didn't know how to do something even a child could do without so much of a thought. I was in the ninth grade. It was my first spring training with the football team at the high school. We were in full pads. We were divided into our position groups, backs over here, offensive backs, defensive backs over here, linemen over here, offensive ones over here, linebackers over here. I was with the offensive linemen, you know, the fat boys. And so we were in full pads, divided into our our positions and going through our warm-up routines. And I could do it all. I'd been playing for about two years. I could do the sprints. I could do the weird stretches. I could do the lunges, even the grass drills and the tackling drills. Even was able to hang with most of the seniors. Didn't bother me. I could do everything, just like everyone else. But then, at the end of our warm-ups, the the O-line coach, Coach Chambers... Who, who wore his pants, I think, higher than the pocket on his T-shirt. He had us get in three lines, side by side, for one final warm-up exercise. And I have to be honest with you, I laughed when I saw what it was. Now, the seniors and upperclassmen had been at the front of the line. They knew what to do. And it was almost comical. 
Here are these, these three guys crouched down like they were about to take off running, waiting for Coach Chambers to tweet his whistle. And while they didn't break loose from the grass, they didn't tear across the field, no, they didn't do any of that. These three burly offensive linemen, you know, guts hanging down under their jersey, all that sort of thing. What they did when Coach blew the whistle, they started to skip. Like schoolgirls. Skip. About 20 yards out, they started skipping. It was like watching overgrown kindergartners in shoulder pads and helmets. Skip across the playground. And I'm not going to lie to you. I sat there and just went, what? Is this a joke? What in the world is going on? Now, they got pretty high. They skipped pretty far. But they were skipping. And see, here's the thing. I laughed until it was my turn. Because here's the thing. I don't know if I had ever skipped in my life. I'm not sure I had ever skipped. And maybe when I was a child, but I had no recollection of skipping. And as the two other guys beside me were getting ready, waiting for Coach to blow the whistle, I was just sort of frozen in that moment. What am I supposed to do? I had no idea about what I was supposed to do. Well, Coach blew his whistle. The other two guys, there they go, skipping. Boop, 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 like they were born to do it, like rabbits. But me, no. I did some weird thing. It must have looked like physical Tourette's. <laughs> I sort of jumped a little bit. I ran a little bit. I hopped a little bit. I think Coach thought I had a stroke. He came over, smacked me on the helmet. Thomas, what in the world's wrong with you, boy? This is not a time to be funny. Now, how do you, as a, as a 14-year-old boy who's played football, for, was named best offensive lineman on the ninth grade junior high team, how do you tell the offensive line coach who already thinks you're an overrated player who talks back too much, how do you tell him, coach, I don't know how to skip? So he made me go back. Did it three more times. I guess to make sure I wasn't just being funny. I think it dawned on him. Poor boy don't know how to skip. <laughs> and so he let the embarrassment be punishment enough. And I went home that night. And y'all, this is no joke. I practiced skipping. Which is a warm-up routine. I practiced skipping until finally it just clicked. It was like, like my brain could finally communicate to the rest of my body, oh yeah, dummy, this is how you do it. And once it did, it was easy. I skipped to the bus. <laughs> I could skip everywhere. Once it clicked, I didn't even have to think about it anymore. That difficulty was over. To tell you the truth, I think a lot of the difficulties in our lives are sort of like that, maybe not as silly. Whether it's the difficulty that comes with learning a new skill, maybe you have to learn Excel on the computer at work. I'm never going to get through this. I don't like it. This is too new. Why can't we just use an old graphing calculator or something like that? But now you go, how in the world can nobody know how to use Excel? Whether it's the difficulty with growing older, you wake up one morning, my, my back, my back is sore. Sore in a place that's never been, been sore before. But now, you just wake up and there's the bottle of aspirin on the nightstand. You know it's coming. Or maybe, maybe it's the difficulty that comes with moving somewhere new. I'm never going to figure out where the Walmart is. I'm never going to get in a rhythm. I'm never going to like this place. But now, now, well, why in the world would I live anywhere else? Or maybe the difficulty that comes with waking up one day in a world missing someone who was there the, na the, the day before. And you think, I'll never get over it. And now here you are, you laugh, you carry on, you go with friends. To eat. There's, a, there's an emptiness, sure, but you, but, but you carry on. And whether, whether we accept it consciously or not, this new reality, the difficulty we once faced, fades and maybe a callous forms, but life goes on. Like it all just eventually clicks into place and you can skip to the school bus. But what if the difficulty doesn't fade? What if a callus never forms and the sore just remains? What if we're reminded of the raw reality of the present difficulty we face every single day? What if life itself is just plain hard? 
And what if its difficulty is of our own making? We're faced this morning with a difficulty in this passage from John's Gospel. At least, at least that's the way the disciples would have us believe it in verse 60. Jesus wraps up really what's this long discourse. John doesn't have a sermon on the mount or a sermon on the plain. John's got the well, more, more nuanced sermon on bread. And he winds up this whole saying about the bread of life. And they all look around at one another and they say to Jesus, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? What teaching? What teaching is difficult for the disciples? Well, it's the first sentence of the passage we read this morning, I think. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Now I can see, I can see how that might be difficult. Eating flesh. Drinking blood. Who's lining up to join that cause? Who's lining up? You almost get the image in your head, don't you? Jesus sticks out his arm, shakes a little salt, maybe rubs a little olive oil on it. All right, boys, take a bite. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood. (laughs) Cannibalism is indeed a difficult teaching. And who would accept it? Certainly not a people for whom there were these strict dietary laws. They couldn't eat catfish and pig, let alone person. And there was a very strict law about consuming the blood of anything. And so Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Yeah, that's a difficult teaching. Or is it? I mean, let's be honest. People have done some weird things for weird reasons all throughout human history, right? Especially since the advent of reality television. They've eaten a plate of crickets or a plate of worms. And Jesus' teaching, if you think about it, is made even less difficult, I suppose, if one considers that really what's happening here in the fourth gospel is that Jesus is projecting forward to the Lord's Supper, to this symbolic flesh and blood of bread and wine. So yeah, if consuming Jesus' flesh and drinking His blood is about sharing in some ritualistic meal, then maybe that teaching isn't as difficult as it seems. So what's so difficult? What if Jesus meant something else? What if it had less to do with eating and drinking and more to do with believing? Yeah, that that, that sounds more religious, doesn't it? Believing. After all, believing something, believing something can be difficult, right? Right? I mean, there are people who refuse to believe all kinds of things, even things that are proven beyond a reasonable doubt, because they find it hard to accept. While there are people who still think the earth is flat, that, that, that the moon landing was fake, that Barry Bonds didn't take steroids, that Hulk Hogan really could body slam Andre the Giant. Believing something that is contrary to what you've believed your entire life is hard. Believing something that that runs counter to your worldview is hard. Believing something that cannot be proven with physical evidence. Believing in something that can't be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Believing in something that runs counter to your overall well-being. All of that is difficult. So maybe... Maybe what the disciples are calling difficult has to do with what Jesus is asking them to believe, to accept. Maybe what Jesus is placing before them is a new idea, a new notion for them to consider, something more for them to believe. It's why he says, does this offend you? So what if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? And so he says, it's the Spirit that gives life, the flesh is useless. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. And then he says, but among you, there are some who do not believe. Maybe that's what Jesus means. Maybe that's the difficult teaching, believing something. Of course, this is only true if one thinks what Jesus is talking about here is some singular moment of intellectual acceptance. As if Jesus meant, just change your mind about something 
and you'll live forever. Change your mind about my divinity, my relationship to God, whatever, and you'll live forever. Just change your mind. Who wouldn't sign up for that? I mean, seriously, it's something I've asked myself for as long as I've been a believer. If it's just about a decision, about some cognitive consent to, to believe that Christ was who he said he was, then why aren't more folks lining up to sign on the dotted line? If this whole faith, religion, Christianity thing is just about siding with the right team, checking the right box, or acknowledging the correct God, then why aren't folks just jumping on the bandwagon? I have a hunch. I have a hunch. And I think it involves what Jesus is really driving at in this difficult teaching that some of his disciples can't get, quite get behind. Yeah, it has to do with belief. But not belief as some surface level agreement with an argument or conclusion. We've kind of worn that word thin. For the Greek word here that's being used by Jesus in this gospel is, is the verbal form of pistis, pistu, a word that means a bit more than just agreement. It implies trust. Trust in the way you'll drive over a bridge and trust it'll hold your car up without so much as a thought. The sort of trust that leads one to make a big, life-altering decision that others might find irrational. The kind of trust that compels one to follow a rabbi who proclaims his own death as a way to life. So maybe, maybe what Jesus is teaching that is so difficult for some of his disciples is this notion of believing in him to the extent that they make otherwise rash decisions. Trusting him so fully they'll leave family and friends to follow him. And I think that's part of it. I really do. I think that's part of what's so difficult about Jesus' teachings, trusting him so deeply that one might be willing to sell everything he has in order to follow him. Trusting Jesus so deeply that, that one is willing to pack her bags, kiss mama goodbye, and move halfway across the world just to serve him. That's part of it. That's part of it. I think that I really do. Because those things are hard. And a lot of folks don't want to follow Jesus that far. A lot of folks are willing to believe the whole get me into heaven and out of hell part, but fewer are willing to answer the more challenging call from Jesus. But what may be more difficult still, what may be the truly difficult teaching of Jesus here, is found right after his words about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Did you catch them? Did you read them? I mean, we hear that part, right? Jesus says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood. But it's that next thing. They abide in me and I in them. They abide in me and I in them. That word abide, it's minno in Greek. It plays like a bass note throughout the fourth gospel. It's a word that means something like to continue on, to not perish, to last, to endure, to hang in there for the long haul. It carries with it the weight of a vow, a promise to endure through whatever may come. And if I'm honest with you, for me, maybe you don't struggle this way, but for me, that's the most difficult part of Jesus' teaching. I think, I think it's easy to take hold of some religious promise about going to heaven when you die or, or getting, getting cured of whatever ails you, of, of getting money, of health, wealth, and prosperity. That's why you'll seldom sit in a funeral service where someone will stand up and act as if the promise of heaven was some passing fad or some new age idea that the recently deceased just happened to miss out on. They didn't know about heaven. It's easy. I think, to simply agree to the terms and conditions. We do it all the time, don't we? Little window pops up, we check the box, we don't read it, just click agree. It's easy to agree to the terms and conditions, to bow your head, to close your eyes, to repeat after the preacher so you can claim your spot in line outside the pearly gates. But it's a little harder. A little harder to give up an otherwise comfortable life. To leave the family business 
To forsake your own personal dreams of fortune and comfort in order to follow Jesus whenever and wherever the calling takes you. But that even still isn't without its joys, without its celebrations, without its triumphs. I mean, don't we call people saints? And put their images in stained glass? But what's truly hard, what is absolutely, I am convinced, the most difficult part of this life of faith is that whole abiding thing. Hanging in there with Jesus no matter what. Now that's most certainly a difficult teaching. To abide with Jesus in the waiting room of the intensive care unit, watching the second hand drag by, waiting for so much as a nurse to come out, for a doctor to say that she's going to pull through this. That's difficult. To abide with Jesus after another collect phone call coming, knowing that he wants you to come pick him up at the jail. That's difficult. To abide with Jesus after praying and praying and praying from relief from the pain, from the dark cloud of depression, and then you wake up the next morning, and there it is, hanging in the closet, waiting for you to put it on. That's difficult. To abide with Jesus after you make sacrifice after sacrifice to give more and more and still feel as if nothing has changed, as if nothing is going to get better, as if things are only getting worse. That's difficult. Is it any wonder then that because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him? Can you blame them? Can you blame them? I mean, I don't mind hanging out with Jesus once or twice a week, maybe inviting him over for dinner every once in a while. Let him tell me about the streets of gold. Let him tell me about what I'm going to get. Let him, let him come over. But, but I can't abide with him all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in his presence all the time. That's just not practical. Staying with Jesus... And there are folks looking to get in the same line with him that aren't fit to be in any sort of a group that I'm willing to be associated with. I don't know about that. If Jesus wants me to abide with him, then Jesus needs to abide in the right places, among the right people, doing the right things. And if Jesus will do that, then, then I might could see my way around it. I might see myself to doing that, to abide with Jesus. But I've read the Bible. And I know Jesus winds up with a lot of folks who I don't want to be associated with. Jesus winds up with a lot of folks on the margins. Folks on the outside of what society and religious folk call acceptable. So I'm not so sure I want to abide with Jesus. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not so sure I want to abide with Jesus if he's going to get tangled up with all those sorts of folks. No, I don't blame the disciples one bit who turned back and no longer went about with Jesus. Because, I mean, if you're just looking for a Savior and someone, someone to pull you out of whatever hell you think you're headed for, but instead you get Jesus asking you to hang in there, though you might have to go through a little hell with Him? I don't know. I can understand turning back. If you want, if you want somebody who's going to cure you, save you, fix you, and then there's Jesus saying, well, just follow me. I don't know. I can understand. I really can why they would turn back. But then there are those words from Simon Peter. When Jesus asked the twelve, his closest disciples, after the others say, this is hard, Jesus. He turns to them and says, do you also wish to go away? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if Jesus is hurt. Or if he's just offering them an out. Do you also wish to go away? Because it's going to get harder. It leads to, to a cross, not, not a nice, cushy desk job. And Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. To whom can we go? 
It's rare, but in the fourth gospel, this time Peter gets it, at least for a moment. Because you see, whether you abide with Jesus or not, the dark days still come. Whether you abide with Jesus or not, those heavy moments of doubt and uncertainty will come. Whether you abide with Jesus or not, you will still walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You will still feel the keen sting of heartache and pain. You will shudder in the cold empty of loneliness whether you abide with Jesus or not. Whether you abide with Jesus or not, those people you sought to keep at an arm's length will inevitably cross your path. But the truth to which Peter testifies here is this. When you abide in Jesus, Jesus abides in you. That when you stay with Jesus, Jesus stays with you. No matter how dark the day gets, No matter how great the pain is, no matter how wrong your thoughts, desires, and notions are, Jesus stays with you. Jesus abides with you so long as you abide with him. And isn't that the good news of the gospel? Isn't it? That no matter where you go, no matter what you do, when you take hold of Christ, Christ takes hold of you. When you seek to trust in Jesus, when you hang in there with Him, no matter where He goes, no matter where He goes with you, no matter where He calls you to go, He hangs in there with you. And that's hard. Because I don't know about you, but I I, I want Jesus to fix all my stuff. I want Jesus to fix everything that's wrong with me and this world and the folks in it. I, want Je- I have these conversations. I know you don't, but I do all the time with myself. Lord, why don't you just fix it? Just fix me. Fix it all. Just fix the world. I'm tired of having to walk through some of this stuff, Jesus. But here's the thing. Jesus walks right through it with me. Every single day time. That's difficult. That's a difficult teaching. To hang in there. To follow Jesus wherever he goes because Jesus goes with you. That's a difficult teaching. But thanks be to God, it's just the one we all need. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, even in this moment now, we pray that you abide with us. Lord, that we may abide with you. To persevere through the trials of this life, knowing, Lord, that you go with us. Lord, to face uncertainty and challenge. To face the things, Lord, that we ourselves do not want to face. Trusting, God, that you are always with us. And may we find joy. May we find hope even in this hard teaching. Even in this hard life of faith. For we know, Lord, that it seems like everything isn't fixed to our liking. As long as you go with us, there is nothing, nothing better in this world. So Holy Christ, be with us now. May your spirit stir in our presence. Call us. Call us into this abiding with you. For we know that when we Trust in you. When we abide with you, you abide with us. Come now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.